so much. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Ryan Sachs, uh, co-founder and CEO of ECO. Um, just to, to get started, uh, a couple observations about the conference so far. It was amazing how many people in this room are first timers this week, at least half of you. Um, in past years versus this year, I think there was uh, more security, uh, focus, protocol focus. Of course, that's still present um, on the heels of a fantastic talk uh, previously. But this year, I think we've seen a lot more focus on money and economics as well, which is an interesting shift. Um, if you look down the program, there are innumerable talks this year uh, about coins. Uh, monetary economics, uh, other currency protocols. And um, so full disclosure, in light of that, I completely changed my mind about what this talk is going to be two days ago. Um, the title still fits, but the substance is very different than it was before because I just want to kind of take a step back from that trend and talk about um, the way we're approaching our concept of money in the crypto space from first principles. Um, so, as I said, uh, the title's still appropriate, the content's slightly different. At ECO, in recent weeks, we've started to finally say a little bit more publicly about uh, what we're up to. And I think that today's talk is a continuation of that theme. Um, so this is really about asking a bunch of questions today. Um, that's kind of the overall tenor of my talk. And I wanna take a step back and reflect on a set of assumptions maybe with respect to cryptocurrencies that I wish were uh, being discussed, uh, debated, maybe even challenged a little bit more often. Um, so to begin with, what is ECO, right? And why do we care? So now that I've blasted you awake with this blue slide, let's get into talking about money uh, and currency economics. Um, it's not even 10 a.m. There's a great day ahead of us. So. ECO is foremost, um, as you can see, a crypto payment network for mainstream adoption. What does that mean? It means that initially uh, we have a set of payment products uh, that we'll be rolling out in months to come, uh, actually sooner than later, within the next two or three months, uh, with an array of e-commerce partners, DAP partners, and independently accepting merchants. And we expect it to be the most seamless way that you can pay with cryptocurrency, initially focused on e-commerce. That's where we're coming from. Uh, as we come into the crypto space. And it turns out that uh, there are a number of corners of commerce where that actually makes sense. It's not just cool, it's a value prop. Um, so that's our initial focus. If you remember nothing else about ECO, remember that our focus is on payment use cases. And that's the world that we're coming from. But down the road, beyond initial payment flows and initial payment integrations, what are we thinking about? Uh, we're thinking about a cryptocurrency designed for spending and what that might mean. Um, and so that's what I'm really going to run with today. And as we get into this, when we think about that, ECO is not a stable coin. Okay? Um, and so let's talk about what we mean by that and let's talk about why. All right, a little background on where we're coming from. Um, before I, I dig into some of the substance. Uh, founded January 2018, kept a low profile ever since as we've grown our team. Our focus is on e-commerce. Uh, the founders come from that space, wrestling with problems of fraud, uh, fragmented payment processing schemes, and limitation of credit card networks uh, in e-commerce today. Turns out those are still really relevant problems as e-commerce grows in the US and beyond. Um, so our initial focus is on opportunity gaps in that space, specifically in the US, to a lesser extent maybe in the EU as well. It turns out that uh, due to the fragmentation in, in our modern payment landscape, there are still really valuable uh, marketplaces, really deep uh, and high volume industries that find it difficult to efficiently accept card payments. And so uh, in our opinion, those present really, really good opportunities for the adoption of crypto closer to home. Right, because you're looking at opportunity gaps in e-commerce where there's not really a high switching cost for consumers relative to their cards because maybe they can't pay with their cards anyway. Um, and so that's the way that we've approached uh, kind of this set of problems about where might crypto be spent and why. Uh, you can really think of it as deconstructing card networks, right? If you have a crypto payment network, a suite of crypto payment products, 
Okay, so maybe you've decentralized some functions of interchange, eliminated, eliminated interchange fees at various junctures. Does that mean that you get away from all of the kind of value add functions that card associations provide? What do you need to maintain? What can you decentralize? Uh, et cetera. That was our initial set of motivating factors, and that's what we've been running with for the better part of a year and a half. We're also thinking about if you solve those problems, you still need a currency. People have to show a willingness to adopt a cryptocurrency for spending. Um, and so what does that actually look like? Well, uh, we spent a long time thinking about that, and um, we really tried hard for a number of months to not posit our own theory but to engage with a number of other projects in the space and look at integrations, look at adoption of their coin and see whether we thought that it could capture the size of commerce volume that we're building for. Um, and so essentially, uh, that was a focus on stable coins, obviously, so it's stable coin landscape. Um, you have all these sort of theories about uh, dollar pig stable coins, basically. That's where kind of each of them are approaching, uh, each of them are targeting, right? You have fiat back, backed, you have crypto collateralized, you have free floating algorithmics, you have soft peg strategies, you have hard peg strategies, uh, you have hybrid or fractional reserve strategies. There's this litany of stable coins, right? Um, and when we were building our initial payment flow, we talked to a bunch of stable coin projects. We diligenced many of them technically, got into their code um, about the prospect of integrating. And at the end of that, uh, we were left a little bit unconvinced that there was a model out there, uh, a stablecoin model out there, that could ultimately scale to the size of the crypto payment opportunity as we see it. Um, and so, uh, you know, to be clear, none of this talk is an indictment of stablecoins. I want to see more of them. I want to see them tried, right? Uh, especially on the algorithmic side. I want to see more developed for specific and targeted use cases. Um, but there's so many of them when we were talking to uh, various potential partnering projects, adoption basically boiled down to marketing. Um, and I think that we can still do quite a bit better than that. I think that there are some theoretical gaps in the cryptocurrency space with respect to economic models that people are proposing that um, maybe we can work with a couple other projects to fill uh, and to try. So what I'm asking here is whether for payments specifically, we've overemphasized exchange rate stability as an overcorrection to kind of Bitcoin's volatility. Uh, that is the prevailing theme of the next few slides. Um, and in doing so, are we trading away some of the features that are more important to actually achieve widespread consumer adoption of cryptocurrency for spending in particular? Keep that in mind, all right? Maybe we're coming at crypto payments from the wrong set of assumptions. It's a set of questions I'm gonna start asking as we move through. All right, quick step back. I know it's early but let's talk about a few key terms and concepts. You'll hear me kind of mention a few of these in passing and I don't wanna dwell on them too much because I'm gonna sort of set forth what I mean here, okay? A few key currency concepts, some of them have been tossed around loosely in my opinion in the space for the last year without enough specificity about what we actually mean, okay? And this is not just in crypto, this extends to monetary economic blog posts and media sphere elsewhere. First one, debasement versus purchasing power erosion. What are we actually saying? Well, what is debasement? Debasement is actually when the underlying asset that you're referenced against changes, okay? Uh, so the underlying asset that your exchange rate is measured against changes or is um, somehow diluted, right? Uh, the hard kind of commodity currency theory of debasement is, okay, I started with a gold coin and at some point, uh, the mint of that gold coin decided to present it or sort of produce it with 5% nickel or silver mixed in, right? So my gold reference kind of asset has been debased. That's different from purchasing power erosion, all right? It might result in purchasing power erosion, but a lot of things can result in purchasing power erosion, okay? A lot of times those two phrases or those two key terms are used interchangeably. I want to make sure that we distinguish them as we're talking about this. Other key terms and concepts, hard peg, soft peg versus a free floating currency. A hard peg has a fixed exchange rate backed by a reserve, all right? Most simply, we see this uh, in the real world in the form of currency boards, right? So a central bank or a currency board basically promises that you can redeem this currency for a fixed exchange rate of something else, and they are supposed to retain enough assets in their reserve to ensure the integrity of that promise, all right? Soft peg, 
A soft peg is a central bank uh, or you know, monetary governor basically saying that we're going to target an exchange rate, but we don't have full reserves to support uh, that exchange rate. So we're going to target it by deploying a number of different strategies usually, um, and we're going to have a little bit of monetary policy flexibility in trying to do that. There are a lot of ways to do a soft peg. Uh, you can read more into them. There are crawling bans, uh, et cetera. A lot of them have been deployed in currencies over the last 20 or 30 years with various levels of success. Um, but they're kind of falling out of favor, and I'll explain more about why. And then there's free-floating currency, right? We're not targeting any particular exchange rate, but we're going to maintain fully independent monetary policy to ensure that we have the confidence of consumers and other actors in the marketplace that this currency is going to continue to, to retain its value, right? Um, so in the crypto space, we kind of call free-floating currencies typically unbacked. Every currency is backed by something. It's just a measure of whether it's backed by something hard or whether it's backed by psychology. But free-floating currencies are essentially backed by psychology and confidence in the integrity of their governance and the economy that backs them. All right? Next sort of turn of phrase, change in supply versus change in purchasing power. This gets at um, a couple different concepts of inflation. This is something that really we've tossed around loosely in the space for the last couple years. There's supply inflation. Uh, you print more. Uh, and then there's a change in purchasing power, right, which is the classical definition of inflation that my money is worth gradually less relative to the price level of goods and services that I'm measuring it against, okay? Uh, another one, deflationary spirals versus confidence panics. Confidence panics happen for a number of different reasons. People flee a currency or some asset for something else. A deflationary spiral might result in a confidence panic, but it's really something different than that. Um, the currency that I'm holding sort of is becoming more valuable relative to the falling prices of goods and services. And the reason that's so dangerous, uh, you know, it doesn't sound bad uh, if you haven't really thought about this before at first blush, my currency, my holdings are becoming relatively more valuable. But the psychology of consumers changes then no one's willing to spend going forward. So prices in the economy continue to fall and you end up with a very low growth or no growth or even negative growth environment. And this is why a lot of times policymakers are kind of concerned about spiraling deflation. In the stablecoin space, we've often kind of loosely tossed out, well, how do you handle deflationary spirals? And what we really mean is how do you handle uh, kind of a crisis of confidence? And those aren't necessarily the same thing. Finally, velocity of money, sort of spending fast and slow. When we talk about velocity of money, we're just talking about how many times during a period of time does one unit of currency change hands, all right? So in the rest of this, uh, I don't want to get bogged down too much in these terms, but I'm going to use each of these terms at some point in the next eight slides, and I want to make sure that we have a really clear concept of what I mean when I say these things, okay? Um, kind of the theme of this slide or the takeaway point is I think that, you know, part of the vendetta to this slide, if you will, is that it's really important to specifically call out the asset with respect to which we're using one of these terms. Because sometimes we're talking about an underlying asset, sometimes we're talking about the currency itself, sometimes we're talking about economic growth trends more broadly that incorporate both those things. And I'd like to see a little bit more uh, intention with the use of some of these terms throughout the space as we talk about these things. So, provocative question. Uh, and again, this is why the title of the talk is still appropriate. Do we actually need stability for payments? Uh, well, it depends on what we mean by stability. Maybe not like we've been thinking about it with regard to exchange rate stability up to this point in time. So you want to really take a step back and think about kind of how does money work in the real world and can we incorporate some of those concepts into crypto? Well, we pay with volatile currencies every day. Why? And this is the, this is the set of questions that I'm not really hearing enough from people in the space. All right, dollar moves 20% against the euro. We continue to spend the dollar. Unless you're a trader at a currency desk or unless you're a Forex trader, uh, maybe in the commodity space, you're not really going to feel the direct pain of that move, uh, at least locally within the U.S., and it's interesting to consider why that is. And maybe to think about a crypto economy that enables us to design for that. Um, and so what do I mean by that? Well, I distinguish stability from predictability, okay? Um, for spending only, predictable exchange rate may, may not matter as much as liquidity uh, or widespread acceptance or just the product and distribution challenge of abstracting UX away from the throes of the currency volatility, right? As consumers in the US, we continue to spend the dollar if it moves a lot against another major reference currency because we feel insulated from that movement for a period of time. And 
if you start to dig into why that is, the network effects that are involved, uh, the fact that merchants trust it to sort of uh, all level out in the end and they continue to, to accept the dollar in the meantime, then you're confronted with a number of new design challenges for a crypto payment economy. And it cannot overlook user experience, it cannot overlook distribution, network effect design, all complementing the actual economic model itself. But the economic model itself is probably not a be-all in this case. Um, so I just covered these points, right? What predictability, what, what predictability actually matters? Well, predictability that this is going to continue to be accepted. Uh, predictability in terms of the way monetary policy is set and the way it is transparency with respect to the way it's managed uh, or measured. Right? And ultimately predictability that even if volatile, it's going to sort of the, the, the walking average of that volatility over time is going to shake out to something that we can tolerate. That is a different set of design assumptions for any you know, currency proposal that I've seen out there. All right, this quote uh, was used yesterday, and I know that. Rod Garrett used this quote yesterday. I didn't even have this in the deck before yesterday, but I like it, so I recycled it. Um, so credit to, to Rod for pulling this up. This is a quote that probably many of you have heard or many of you have seen. Uh, it's Augustin Carson's, uh, the chairman of the BIS. Really, uh, this quote came out of a talk that's highly, highly critical of cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin especially. But I'm recycling it here because I think that the integrity of this quote remains intact, right? Trust is the fundamental tenet that underpins credible currencies, and this trust has to be earned and supported. I fully subscribe to that statement. The tried, trusted, and resilient monitor sort of resilient modern way to provide confidence in public money is the independent central bank. I subscribe to that statement as well. Um, so in spite of the fact that the context here is highly critical of the way we're going about cryptocurrency development or cryptocurrency uh, theorizing, I think that these points hold, trust being the big one, okay? So maybe if we take that and run with it, we lead to a slightly different approach. So let's come at this from a different angle, right? Maybe low volatility or perceived stability is really just stable trust, and maybe that can be achieved in a number of different ways uh, beyond mere exchange rate targeting, right? So supply inflation, maybe even exchange rate volatility could be tolerable so long as, as a consumer, your purchasing power relative to the goods that you care to use that currency for remains consistent or is sustained over time. And that doesn't necessarily require exchange rate stability, okay? So when we think about this, we started to think of kind of in the early days of our project, you know, what would this look like? If you're going to design this currency, if you're going to adopt it for payment, if you're going to try to feed it into our own products as an option. Well, soft pegs haven't worked well. They haven't worked well in the real world. We haven't seen a convincing argument as to why they would work really well in crypto yet and why they would work well at scale uh, for billions or hundreds of billions of dollars in transaction volume. Hard pegs certainly don't scale to that level. They work, right? But if the size of the crypto economy sort of addressable market gets to a trillion dollars in transaction volume, then there's a massive vulnerability with going about that based on a hard peg, some assets being managed by actors, a set of banks, one bank, whatever it may be. The cost of capital, the cost of management for that economy and the underlying currency gets to be prohibitive. So what are we left with? Well, we're left with let the thing float, right? Provocative statement. Scary statement. What happens when you do that? Well, none of us know, but nobody's tried it yet. Um, and then you model letting it float for restrained volatility over time. So let's talk a little bit more about that with this different approach sort of mentality. If you let the thing float, then you're talking about independent crypto monetary policy and thinking about what that actually means and how that can be implemented, all right? You're talking about inflation targeting, something that we do in the real world. Uh, that ultimately leads to the end goal of sustained purchasing power for consumers using this currency, again, relative to the use cases that they want to adopt it for. Not all things to all people, okay? And if we're talking about independent and dynamic monetary policy, then we're also talking about focusing on governance and distribution, okay? So this is a brave new world, uh, but let's not do away with our best precedent. We have good examples for how uh, money with high integrity is managed uh, in the real world, and not all of those need to be thrown away just because we port some concept of monetary policy onto the blockchain. 
just means they need to be re-engineered. That's a really hard set of problems, but it's not a blank slate, all right? So let's continue following this down. You're talking about policy primitives, uh, how to do monetary policy in a blockchain. Uh, let's look at first how we deploy these things in the real world, and let's talk a little bit more about how they might look different or how we might iterate on these things in a crypto environment. All right, you're managing a currency, central banks managing a currency. Obviously, uh, you're going to have some strategy for supply variation, right? Typically, open market operations um, in the US is the most relatable way that this is done. Okay, you're gonna vary interest rates. Um, you're gonna have reserve requirements. And in some concept, you're gonna have variable transaction fees. That can just be a different concept, a different interest rate deployed for certain types of transactions uh, or a different spread in certain areas of the marketplace. But there's some concept of varying transaction fees as you want to try to speed up or slow down velocity in your economy. All right? So if we run with this a little bit more, um, the Fed actually publishes the way it makes decisions, okay? Um, you can read transcripts uh, and you can understand the decision-making framework that goes into any uh, given federal board meeting about kind of what comes out of that meeting, the interest rate variation, the interest rate targets that they ultimately publicized, okay? There are three key principles of good monetary policy according to the Fed. One is that monetary policy should be well understood and transparent, okay? They've actually made a lot of headway over the last 30 years in making it more transparent. I don't know that it's well understood, but I believe that's true. Second thing, you should have variable stimulus and restriction based on inflation and economic growth trends. Of course, that's what they do. They meet periodically to vary interest rates in response to those metrics. Finally, you should disproportionately vary interest rates based on inflation trends. All right, according to the Fed, those are three concepts of good monetary policy making. The reason I call those things out now is because none of them are mutually exclusive with a blockchain environment. You might change the decision makers and you might change the incentive mechanism for the way they make those decisions, but you can still make those things, uh, you, still, you can still design those goals into your system and into your model. And I think that's really interesting. So we talk about these policy primitives, we're talking about supply variation, interest rate variation, transaction fee variation, and maybe some concept of, res of a reserve. Let's talk about how we can drill down on these things and maybe even extend them in a blockchain environment because this is where, in my opinion, it gets to be really, really fascinating as a grand experiment. New possibilities. Well, in a blockchain environment, you have the option to have more efficient supply distribution. What do I mean by that? Well, let's think about in the fiat economy right now or in our economy in the US, the Federal Reserve is one huge step removed from the consumer through the fractional reserve system whereas the crypto mint, if you will, can go directly to users. That's really, really powerful, okay? The Federal Reserve and other central banks in the world are notoriously bad at predicting, modeling, or influencing velocity of money. It's really, really hard to do when you have a delay lag in your sort of the data that you take in, and when you have a bunch of kind of incentive conflicted private actors in the banking system standing between you and the ultimate end consumer that you want to influence, all right? In a crypto economy, maybe there is a lot better opportunity to optimize for velocity, the last point of this slide. Another really interesting thing you can do with supply distribution is you can exercise a sort of a measure of randomness, right? You want to increase velocity. What if you increase supply distribution in some nonlinear fashion to create a wealth effect? Maybe that's a lot more efficient than just kind of releasing through open market operations a load of new cash into the economy and trusting it to trickle down. These are really, really interesting mechanisms to, to consider. A lot of them are hard to implement. Many of them have not been done, but they're all theoretically feasible in a blockchain economy. Another really interesting thing is dynamic risk pricing, okay? Uh, this is kind of that variable fee structure that I'm talking about. With a bunch of volume in blockchain, you have really, really good observability into use cases where and when things are happening. Even if you're abstracting away user information to enforce privacy, you still have this great stream of data about what people are paying for and through various products, maybe why, all right? With enough data, you can start to construct some uh, formulation of reputation. And you can get at this, in my opinion, sort of holy grail of dynamic risk pricing for any given transaction. Today, uh, the way this would work, uh, or the way this doesn't work, uh, more aptly put, is that I go get a coffee and I sweat my card and I pay 2.9% on that card, right? And then I go online and I buy a TV from someone on eBay who I've never interacted with and I pay 2.9% on that card payment. That makes no sense. Makes no sense whatsoever. Starbucks should probably pay me to go get coffee there, reward points, something else, right? 
uh, they can wash out that card fee. That's a really low fraud kind of risk transaction, whereas buying the TV online is a really high risk transaction. And what you can think about with the crypto payment economy is having the necessary metadata to really parse that fee structure with a lot more fidelity. That's really interesting to us as well. And then finally, what can you do with better data? You can build a better price index, okay? Uh, you can build a price index that tracks the way that people actually care to adopt this currency. And honestly, that's the only volatility and purchasing power metric that matters, right? If nobody uses, uses the currency for this good over here, uh, its volatility relative to that good doesn't matter a hell of a lot. But if they're using it for this subset of things, and we know that with really, really high fidelity data in real time, then all of a sudden we can start to think about, you know, is there a better version of CPI for this crypto economy in its set of transactions? Uh, all of these things are uh, economic thoughts, experiments, designs, and even implementations that we've undertaken in our project over the course of the last year. So let's step back really quickly. Um, I've asked several questions. I proposed a few high-level ideas. And let me ask, why is this even interesting or worth researching? It's a moonshot, right? It's sort of a grand dream for a broader cryptocurrency for payments, cryptocurrency for spending in particular. Well, first of all, it's pretty clear our traditional concepts of money and our measures of currency performance are being strained by new market conditions. This is not intended to have some sort of political overtone. There's just substan substantial evidence uh, that the way we manage our money, the way we dictate monetary policy uh, in open markets is you know, not keeping up with the demands of modern commerce in various ways. Many of our concepts of money have been flipped on their heads in recent years, right? Really interesting recent headline, uh, the Federal Reserve is starting to be worried that CPI doesn't reflect the things that we actually value most, all right? So they're running these open market surveys asking people, what would you pay for Facebook? What would you pay for Google, right? How much time are you spending on these platforms and what would it take for us to pay you to trade that time off to do something else productive? That needs to be factored into uh, people's perception uh, or sort of the Federal Reserve's perception of people's perception of their own wealth. And right now they really don't know how to, me how to measure it. Uh, most people in this room probably know that there are negative interest rates all over Europe, including in the mortgage market, which kind of flips time value of money and our concept of interest rates on its head. We've never really dealt with this before. Uh, the Federal Reserve official monetary velocity charts, the one that's kind of in the background there that's produced by the Federal Reserve uh, branch in, in St. Louis periodically. And you'll notice something really interesting here. Monetary velocity since the beginning of its measurement in the U.S. economy is the lowest it's ever been. Um, it usually averages out something between 1.8 and 1.2 on a quarterly basis. Right now it's 1.45. No one knows why. And over the course of the last 10 years, as you can see, it's steadily been falling in spite of essentially a zero interest rate environment. Um, again, that's just uh, really challenging the Fed to manage our economy and uh, kind of outside the box of traditional mechanisms. Um, and then finally, obviously, President Trump uh, places his thumb on the Federal Reserve scale uh, once a week, it seems like, and recently has been calling for negative interest rates. Uh, and there's been a lot of publicity around that. Um, so, it's pretty clear that our concepts of money are changing a little bit, or maybe that we need to actually challenge the assumption that our everyday fiat currencies are the best medium of exchange for all corners of commerce, which is a little bit provocative to suggest, but I don't see any reason why it's not worth suggesting, all right? Why else would this be interesting to people? Well. Such a proposal should draw the interest of some in the central bank digital currency community, put aside the fact that those don't need to be on the blockchain, but uh, many central banks seem resigned to architecting them that way. Because this proposal that I'm describing translates central bank policy mechanisms into a blockchain environment, and a lot of that is non-trivial to implement, really non-trivial to implement. Dynamic interest rates, dynamic sort of inflation distribution, variation in transaction fees in the economy, uh, those are hard. Uh, they're kind of easy to understand in concept. They're really, really difficult to engineer uh, on our current protocols today. Um, I will say, from our perspective, it's also increasingly apparent that legacy payment infrastructure is underserving the needs of modern commerce. Uh, on the fringes of, 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 of the e-commerce e market, in legal industries, there are really distorted risk pricing models all over the place. And it's pretty apparent that you know, our legacy payment infrastructure designed four decades ago does not accommodate very well 
uh, velocity of money or risk pricing uh, or other payment use cases throughout our own economy, much less cross-border. Um, and our legacy payment infrastructure certainly will not efficiently serve many of the new marketplaces that are enabled by blockchain. So uh, finally, really interesting to me, many of our new applications and dApps will test new price structures. And hopefully they'll do so built on Web3 infrastructure. I think it's the most interesting project uh, or to project that going forward and imagine a decoupling of those economies, sharing economies, Web3 economies, whatever they may be, from fiat. And to imagine a new crypto unit of account shared between those various distributed applications uh, and their various user bases. I think that's a really, really interesting vision of the future. I don't think there's any reason why we shouldn't suggest that if Web3 is successful at scale and enables another, a number of new marketplace categories to form, that they should default to the same unit of account that we've, all, we've always used uh, or that we're used to today. Um, so what's the road ahead um, for ECO and for our partners and for our contributors? Uh, well, as I mentioned before, our payment products in particular are launching in beta um, actually later this year, uh, and we'll continue that testing through early 2020. We'll have code release with fully audited proof of, sort of proof of concept of this currency model in the next month. Um, that audit report is ready to go. It's, uh, it's a slimmed down version of some of the policy variables that I discussed, uh, but it works uh, in various ways. The smart contracts mechanism, mechanisms work, right? And so what we're going to do with that is we're going to take that model, we're going to publish it, we're going to invite a bunch of contribution and surely a lot of skepticism, and we're going to extend it to a more complex version over the course of coming months uh, that involves some of the more kind of complex policy levers that I discussed in the what's possible slide earlier, right? It's all about creating an ecosystem for us, accepting partners, uh, channels for payment and adoption, economic contributors, etc. So if I'm going to roll all that up into our motivation, I'll say that we're out to build a spendable medium of exchange cryptocurrency that, number one, anticipates new financial infrastructure and marketplace categories, and number two, enables a genera generational leap ahead in payment security and inclusion. So if you're in this room and that interests you, if you want to learn more, honestly, I invite you to join us. We're at a period now where we're rolling out new information about what we're up to, what we're thinking about, what we'd like to see the crypto space look like two years from now. And we're always inviting new contributors. Really interesting research questions that we're wrestling with right now, appropriate for this particular crowd and this particular talk. New price index formulation. I mentioned that before. You have all this great transaction data. You have it in real time. It enables kind of us to, to challenge our, our modern concept, concept of CPI, maybe extend it, right? Designing live test games, all right? This is not sort of an algorithmic proposal. This involves a lot of behavioral economics. Uh, maybe some subset of expert users, expert nodes, call them trustees, votes periodically on dynamic monetary policy uh, sort of variables. There's an output of that vote. And then you expect people to behave. That's really, really difficult to test. Really difficult to test, but it's also a really interesting game. Um, the voting mechanism for varying, varying that policy. Maybe you have four levers you could pull. Do you pull them all at the same time? Vary them all at the same time? Do you reduce it to one or two? What does the input look like? What does the output look like? And how does that flow to the rest of the economy and to your user base? There are many other questions like this that we're wrestling with. And if you're an economist in the crowd, if you're a computer scientist, if you're a psychologist, uh, if your interests and your expertise bear on this set of questions, then we would love for you to talk to us. Uh, and we would love for you to join our dialogue and to join um, some of our ongoing debate and ongoing design sessions about what this looks like when we take the proof of concept that we've already developed and we extend it to something um, launch ready over the course of the next several months. And I'm going to wind it all up. One of my favorite quotes that sort of sums up what we're all about is this quote from Friedrich Hayek. A money deliberately controlled and supplied by an agency whose self-interest forced it to satisfy the wishes of users might be the best. And that's what we started with. That's what we hope to end with. And it's been a wonderful journey in between with a long road ahead. With that, in the interest of time to catch us back up on the schedule, I will defer questions to private discussion. If you'd like to approach me and members of my team who are here, we'll be in the back outside the doors. And I thank you very, very much for your time and your attention.